Okay, I want to welcome everybody here this afternoon uh, for one of our uh, 125th anniversary lectures. This is pancreas cancer, as you all know. Um, this is a uh, serious disease that uh, has mystified society and physicians uh, for eternity. And uh, we have decided to take a scientific approach to this problem over the last five to 10 years here at Cold Spring Harbor with the establishment of a designated laboratory to fight this disease. So taking uh, world-class researchers and applying it to a serious medical and health problem. And this has been a partnership, as you know, with the Les Garden Foundation, uh, uh, who is the biggest funder, uh, private funder of pancreatic cancer research in America and uh, probably worldwide. Um, and so when my laboratory was based uh, back in Britain uh, some five years ago, conversations started then about potentially doing something like this. And I was hesitant uh, because Cold Spring Harbor is known for its fundamental biology expertise for making discoveries in the structure of DNA, RNA, for describing what a gene means, um, for developing the first plant that can resist disease, things like that. And I w I'm a scientist, but I'm a physician scientist. I'm used to being surrounded by doctors who wear white coats, who have little pieces of metal stuck to them that beep and make noises. And it's a different type of, of existence than a quiet, bucolic place where people think deeply and are not bothered uh, by the outside world. Um, but the discussions with uh, Dr. Bruce Stillman and Jim Watson, Dave Spector, uh, proved very fruitful. And um, I was convinced this could be a, an interesting way to try to solve a hard problem. Um, and so we've been here for three and a half years uh, due to the generous support of uh, the Les Garden Foundation and due to the support of the laboratory. Um, it's been tremendous. Um, you're going to hear a bit about what's happened over the last 1,200 days uh, in my lab. Uh, but today you're going to really get, a, I think, a, a glimpse of this disease through the eyes of a physician who takes care of pancreas cancer patients every day, Dr. Craig DeVoe from the North Shore Long Island Jewish Health System. And you'll hear from the Les Garden Foundation, who again was um, really the driving force uh, to recruiting me here. And so in this foundation, I have the privilege to serve as the director of research. And so I can vicariously try to per, you know, persuade others to study ideas that I might have or things I've heard about um, in other labs, inside or outside of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. And the foundation uh, responds rapidly to new ideas and has mobilized dream teams of researchers throughout the country and as of yesterday throughout the world uh, to fight this uh, terrible disease. Um, and so I work on a daily basis with Dr. Bob Vizza uh, and Ms. Carrie Kaplan. Um, and you're going to hear from uh, Carrie now to describe her perspective of this disease through the eyes of our foundation and how important it is that Cold Spring Harbor has opened its doors to um, agreeing that problems of health um, are as important as fundamental biology uh, topics, which again, are usually the things that we've worked on for the last 125 years here. Um, our job, of course, in studying this disease is to solve it. Um, just like when you study a basic science problem, your, your job is to solve it so you can go on to the next problem. And we're in the throes of it right now, so I can't say we've solved it. Um, but things have certainly gotten very interesting and exciting um, in this direction. And so without further ado, I'm going to introduce Carrie, um, who's then going to give perspective on the foundation. And then I'll introduce Dr. DeVoe, who will give a clinical perspective on this disease. And then finally, you'll hear from me about what's happened over the last 1,200 days. So again, welcome. And so we're now going to hear from Ms. Carrie Kaplan. Thank you. It's a pleasure to join you uh, all here today, a beautiful day, beautiful setting. Um, I'm not sure how much people know about the Lusk Garden Foundation. Uh, we were established in 1998. 
At that time, there was very little research being done. Uh, the federal government was spending less than half of 1% of its funds on pancreatic cancer research. There were no private foundations dedicated to disease. Uh, patients had nowhere to get any information from, and there was really no research being done. So that's why the foundation was established, to fund research to find an early detection test, to find better therapies, and to find a cure for pancreatic cancer, which was at the time really an orphan cancer, but you know, many of you in this room may know, you know, had a terrible prognosis and is really had something had to be done. So uh, the original strategy of the Luskarton Foundation was really just to put money into getting people interested in working on this disease. It's a tough cancer. How can we get people interested? You know, research follows dollars. And then we took a more focused approach and we started to focus our research. We really needed an early detection initiative. We must have a blood test for this disease because if it's caught early, it can be surgically removed and that's our best chance for patients. We must do clinical trials. We partner with Stand Up to Cancer. We're funding many, many clinical trials. And we must recruit the best and the brightest people to be in this field. We have our, our researchers, our research investigators, and our wonderful program, our distinguished scholars, which include Bert Vogelstein from Johns Hopkins, Ron Evans from the Salk Institute, and two of them are here today, uh, Dr. Douglas Fearon, who is at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. Dr. Fearon is a world-renowned immunologist. Um, that's a sort of a buzzword for cancer in general these days. We need to see how we can turn people's own immune systems to fight pancreatic cancer, and there's no one better in the world equipped to do this. So Doug Fearon recently became one of our distinguished scholars. And our first distinguished scholar was David Tuvison. Um, David and this lab are very unique. Uh, we, the Lost Garden Foundation actually is based in Long Island and of course knew about, about Cold Spring Harbor Lab and have been funding research here for many years. Many well-known researchers, Scott Lowe and Greg Hammond and Michaela Egelbod, you know, were, were at Cold Spring Harbor and we were funding them. But as David mentioned, we worked with Cold Spring Harbor to bring Dr. Tuvison here to start a dedicated lab for pancreatic cancer. And what's unique, you know, unlike the other distinguished scholars, David has always had his attention to pancreatic cancer. From the beginning of his career, he wanted to fight the toughest fight. He's been working on pancreatic cancer since, you know, he started working in this field as both a MD and a PhD. He has a wonderful lab. Many of his scientists are here today, and they are completely focused on pancreatic cancer and have been. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure exactly what he's going to talk about, but they're looking at things like, how do we take the one biomarker that we have for this disease, CA199, and actually make it more effective by using it as an early detection marker? You know, things like pathways, you know, new, new pathways for this disease. Uh, clinical trials, uh, which he's working on with Dr. DeVoe, about breaking down the stroma around the disease because Dr. Tuvison was actually the researcher that, that did the work and published the work that there is a, a, a barrier around the tumor that prevents chemotherapy from getting into the tumor. Um, and, and I'm sure he will talk about Unbelievable, sort of like forthright to say, you know, I've, I've heard of this brilliant uh, scientist over in the Netherlands who has a new model for pancreatic cancer. Of course, that's David Tuvison's background is, is the, he created the mouse model for pancreatic cancer. So he said there's this new technology, these organoids that are, you know, being tested in prostate cancer and we, we have to do that for pancreatic cancer. And his lab has created the a brand new organoid system, which we think will one day really help do personalized medicine for people with pancreatic cancer. And it's just my pleasure to be here to share David and his lab with Cold Spring Harbor and to know that there is this group here, David, his lab, Doug and his lab, completely dedicated to finding a cure for pancreatic cancer because this to me is a time, I'm, I'm, I've been at the foundation for about 10 years and from when I started till now, there is just so much hope and so much progress and we are really 
finding new avenues, find, you know, when, when, I, there, when I started there was sort of the one drug that wasn't very effective. Now there have been all these clinical trials. There's new therapies for patients, and it wouldn't be, that, you know, without people like Doug and David, we wouldn't be there. And Dr. DeVoe, who actually treats the patients and, and meets with them and decides what therapy they should have. So it's a pleasure for the Lust Garden Foundation to be funding this lab. And, you know, we look forward to a day when we shut the lights out and we close the doors. We'll, we'll get David and Doug to do something else when we find a cure for this disease. So I look forward to um, hearing what they have to say today. Thank you, Carrie. That was that was terrific. Um, and so now I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Craig DeVoe, who is um, a medical oncologist at the North Shore LIJ Health System. He cares for um, many different types of cancer patients, but he has a particular interest in uh, pancreas cancer. And uh, I've gotten to know Craig over the past three years. Uh, it's been uh, uh, educational for me and uh, enjoyable, and I'm looking forward to a much closer um, working relationship with him over the next few months and years as Cold Spring Harbor and uh, the health system um, are starting a, a translational research uh, program, uh, which would include preclinical as well as clinical um, efforts. Um, and again, I, I want to thank uh, Craig for attending my lab retreat uh, a few weeks ago when he got to hear um, in concentrated fashion uh, about many of the things that uh, we're working on. And he gave a very nice uh, um, overview there about uh, his experience as a, as a medical oncologist, and I think that really helped uh, my postdocs and students uh, hearing that. So again, Craig, thank you very much for uh, coming today. We're looking forward to it. Well, I want to thank um, Les Garten and Dave and uh, Cold Spring Harbor and all of you for uh, uh, coming out today. Um, I've been a uh, medical oncologist for 15, 15 years now. Um, I as Dave said, I treat um, pancreas cancer uh, for a good part of that uh, time. I also, one of the other areas of interest I have is melanoma. And as I go through the talk, um, uh, I'm going to make some comparisons to another uh, also very uh, challenging disease. So, let me just see if I can. I want to start off with um, some basics. Uh, there's people of all varied backgrounds here, and I just want to make sure we're all talking about the same thing. So, um, so just basically speaking, the, the pancreas is this sort of oblong-shaped structure uh, that sits nestled in, in the abdominal cavity um, uh, next to uh, 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 next to it lies uh, some major uh, major blood vessels, uh, which we'll we'll look at in a minute. Um, what does the pancreas do? Well. It, Primarily, it's an enzyme factory to help us digest food. Um, the three major uh, elements of, uh, of food being fats, proteins, and uh, carbohydrates, uh, and the pancreas has, a, has an answer for all three of those uh, with se several enzymes that it secretes to help us digest food so that we could actually absorb it. Uh, its other significant function, so-called so endocrine function, is to produce insulin, so when the food is digested, in particular carbohydrates turned into sugars and get into the bloodstream. The insulin produced by the pancreas is secreted into the bloodstream, and uh, that insulin drives the sugar into the cells, and the cells derive energy uh, from the sugar. Uh, looking at the pancreas uh, with a little bit less structures around it, we see some of these small ductules and uh, forming major ducts that empty right into the intestinal lumen here. Uh, some other things I want you to notice about the pancreas is that it overlies some major blood vessels here. Uh, this is the portal vein traveling underneath it. It becomes a superior mesenteric vein, this is a called SMV, and we talk about this with patients all the time. Um, and uh, this, this is a major blood vessel here, and the uh, vein rather, and this is the major artery. And both of these, vein and artery, feed the intestine uh, nutrients uh, and are critical uh, for uh, everything that happens below there uh, in the abdominal cavity. I also want you to take note here of the celiac artery, which also comes off the aorta and is very closely related to the whole tail of the pancreas and feeds it nutrients here. Around the base of this artery is something called the celiac plexus, which many of you know as the, as the solar plexus. 
And one might imagine if there were a tumor here uh, that invades up into these nerves, uh, could be quite painful uh, due to the uh, high concentration of nerve roots that, that exist in that area. Flipping the pancreas around, uh, we're looking at it in the behind now, we could see those vessels going through the back, next to the back, but intimately involved with the head of the pancreas in something called the uncinate process, which is this little tail right here. Uh, but these two vessels sit nestled in right into the back of the pancreas, and again, that celiac artery right there. And one could imagine, again, a tumor located in this area, how difficult it might be to, to resect it in certain cases, given the close relationship of these major blood vessels, which, which must be there. They, they can't be so-called sacrificed. We could also just see briefly the bile duct coming in, which is a adjoins the pancreas duct, and then the two of them together empty their uh, uh, enzymes into the uh, intestine there. Just a, <clears throat> a note on lymph nodes, uh, they, they, they surround the entire pancreas um, and are um, part of the normal immune system uh, and lymphatic system, and uh, cancer cells that start to uh, become more aggressive within the pancreas hijack these lymph nodes and start to take hold and grow within them and they become enlarged. How do, we, how do we visualize the pancreas in people? Well, we use CAT scans and MRIs, and this is what's called a cross-sectional imaging, and out coming towards you is the person's feet, and in going would be the head, so they're laying down and doing a cut across. And we can see the different organs, such as the liver and the stomach and the pancreas. And again, you'll notice that major vessel there, the uh, superior mesenteric vein and the aorta and the superior mesenteric artery uh, sitting right under, uh, underneath the uh, pancreas. Uh, what we actually see is a, on a CAT scan is, is a little bit less well-defined, a little hazier, uh, not an artistic rendition, but you know, an, an X-ray-derived um, um, anatomy. Again, the liver, pancreas. So these are the images that we look at oftentimes in our tumor boards uh, when we're deciding whether or not a patient can go straight to surgery or whether or not we need to do something first to try to convert the tumor or shrink it a bit so that the surgeon can go in. Um, we also look at the liver. Uh, this is one of the areas that the disease might spread to um, early on uh, in some cases. So <clears throat> to, to provide some framing of, of the disease, let's talk about it in a population-based manner for a minute. Uh, this is epidemiology of the disease. Um, There's uh, approximately 47,000 cases estimated for this year, and uh, according to ACS, um, it's about 1.5% lifetime risk in the U.S. per individual. Uh, fourth leading cause of death, uh, c cancer death in U.S. men and women. The average age is around 72, and it's rare before 45. And the majority of pancreas cancers are something called pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. These are tumors that arise from that lining of the ducts that we looked at before, the epithelial lining of those ducts. And there are other pathology types that uh, we're not going to primarily get into today, but have uh, various uh, different uh, um, uh, histologies and prognostic features. What are the risk factors for pancreas cancer? Well. There's, there's not well, many well uh, clear uh, risk factors, but uh, there are several that, that are known to increase the risk. Cigarette smoking appears to double the risk per epidemiologic studies. And interestingly, that risk will go away 15 years after stopping smoking. Um, there's been a question whether or not uh, diabetes causes pancreas cancer, it, whether it's causal or it's a consequence due to the pancreatic failure causing the loss of insulin and the, and the elevation of blood sugar. Um, so that's really not clear at this point. Um, high body mass index, um, many of you may be aware of the so-called BMI, uh, so obesity basically, um, is, is, this is not a conclusive uh, risk factor at this point. Um, chronic pancreatitis is a in chronic inflammatory state um, and is definitely associated with pancreatic cancer in, in the individuals that have that um, with a 5% lifetime risk. Um, um, 
but it doesn't show up till the inflammation has been present for a number of decades. Other genetic risk factors exist. Um, however, when we talk about genetic risk, we're thinking of familial risks. But it turns out that we don't know a variety of the genetic risk factors that, that currently exist. We do know that in families that uh, have pancreas cancer, uh, five to 10% of individuals will have had, a, with, with the disease, will have a family history uh, of the disease. So, um, but again, what I'm trying to say is we don't know always, always what those genetic mutations are. Um, for instance, if you have three first degree relatives, you have a, a 32 times baseline risk of developing pancreas cancer. Uh, if you have uh, two first degree relatives, it's six and one is four. Uh, first degree relative, I should have defined as you know parent, sibling, or child. Um, but again, less commonly, there are specific genetic mutations uh, that are associated with pancreas cancer. And these various syndromes, uh, I've listed a number of them here, um, are typically diseases that are uh, caused by uh, the mutation of a tumor suppressor gene. A tumor suppressor gene is a gene that if it's not working properly, uh, doesn't, cause, uh, doesn't limit the, the cell growth or the tumor growth. So it's uh, one of the ways that um, uh, cells become cancerous. So one of the more uh, well-known is the BRCA, BRCA2 and 1. And there's also, this is also associated too in that complex, uh, PALB2, um, leading to a lifetime risk of about 3 to 5% uh, for pancreas cancer if you carry that gene. Again, the baseline being about 1.5% lifetime risk. Um, another interesting uh, syndrome due to a, a mutation, again, another tumor suppressor called P16, the FAM syndrome, where melanoma and pancreas cancer can both be potential outcomes of that mutation. And there's another variety of them. Just uh, looking at hereditary pancreatitis, there's specific gene mutations with ex very, very high lifetime risks of pancreatic cancer. So I put uh, Jimmy Carter in here blowing out his 90th birthday uh, candles. Um, as we all know, he was, uh, he was uh, found to have a, a, a metastatic cancer earlier this year. And I, I didn't know what it was right away as I was reading the press. And I, all I did know is that his brother, his father, his two sisters all died from pancreas cancer. So I assumed you know, he was going to get it. And as, I, as we look at the... Um, uh, prior uh, list, um, um, there was he had about a 32 or even higher lifetime risk of uh, percent lifetime risk of developing pancreas cancer, but uh, in fact he has developed metastatic melanoma. So, as we looked at our prior list, there potentially they have a p16 gene mutation in their family. I I don't know; it hasn't been reported in the news site. I, I checked recently, um, and, and, um, and I want to come back to melanoma again a little later, uh, given some incredibly uh, exciting and hopeful developments in a disease that had been hitherto uh, very, very challenging, very like what, what we're dealing with with pancreas cancer. So part of the point of this slide is to show that we call the penetrance of a gene. So even though you have a gene mutation, you don't know what's going to what, if, if it's going to express itself in a particular patient or in what way it's going to express itself. Um, so these things become difficult to predict for sure with certainty. So can we screen for pancreas cancer? Uh, as was mentioned earlier, is there a blood test? Is there a, a scan? Um, we know that finding it early would be the, clearly the best way to just not have it in the first place, just get rid of it. Um, so surgery, we do know, has been the only potentially curative treatment, historically anyway. Um, so if you find it early, it's small, and you remove it, patients have the potential for, for cure. However, only 15 to 20 percent of patients present in a way that's early enough for them to be resected. So there most patients, that is, the, the converse is that, say, 80 percent are not candidates to surgery at time of diagnosis. So, and the other issue with screening is that 
you know, the lifetime risk for one individual is 1.5%. So any given year, you just divide that by, by how many years they're going to live, and it becomes very small to find it year by year. And there isn't really an accurate or low-cost or non-invasive diagnostic test uh, that's FDA approved at this point. Let's compare that to breast cancer, for instance, where it has a 12.5% lifetime risk. Uh, and there is a screening test called a mammography. And it's, although it's not invasive, it's not exactly comfortable, but this is something that uh, gives us some comparative uh, thoughts. So what if we looked at the very highest risk patients, those with BRCA mutations or chronic pancreatitis, or those with the several first degree relatives? There was a, a small study in, 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 of 31 patients, I believe this was at Columbia, uh, using MRI and endoscopic ultrasound, which is basically an upper endoscopy with a sonography camera on the end of it, and doing the gene testing. And in, in this little study, two out of 31 patients with the high risk family history were found to have cancer. One was resectable and one wasn't. And then five had these lesions called IPMNs, which are lesions that can be there for years and years before they actually become cancer. So it's unclear um, if those would have ever become cancer in the first place. But the point is, is that even in the highest risk patients, uh, only one patient uh, out of 30 was found to be able to go to surgery in a preventative way. So. The bottom line is at this point in time in the clinical world, um, no study has shown that screening increases survival. Just a brief word on staging. Um, you know, the, what we call AJCC staging is based on the size of the tumor, uh, being less than two, greater than two centimeters, or one that is growing out of the, beyond the pancreas, or what we call a T4 something that's growing, okay, into other vessels or other organs near the pancreas. So we use these stages to predict survival from, and this is the one sort of overall survival in 2000, and this is around 2013 when this slide was made. We can see the average survivals uh, over these time periods um, have gone up a little bit. Um, but clinical trials are critical. We, we need to do much better than it. Um, you know, a two-year uh, survival for the, even for the earliest stage patients, um, uh, this is not sufficient. This means that many of these patients are still not cured, even with the smallest uh, lesions found. Just getting back to the presentation, so when a patient is found to have pancreas cancer, in, in what way are they presenting? Well, again, 15% are clinically localized, so they have those very small lesions, those two-centimeter lesions, and they're resectable. Okay, at the time of the presentation, so they go right for surgery. 35% um, of what we call locally advanced. So these are patients with disease that are uh, either in, you know, invading some of the arteries, the superior mesenteric artery or the celiac artery or nerves, and they're not resectable, or the ones that just slightly affecting it enough that if we give some treatment and radiation and such before the surgery, that we might be able to convert them into a resectable situation and then send them for surgery. So for localized pancreas cancer, um, we say resectable, again, would be the resectable and borderline resectable. Uh, as I had mentioned, these are, these are cases that go either right to the operating room to, to have margin negative resection. Again, that's the goal, so that the surgeon can go in with some level of confidence that the imaging shows us um, that it'll be successful surgery. Um, and oftentimes, even after that successful surgery, uh, based on the fact that many patients still relapse, will deliver some adjuvant or additional chemotherapy um, after the surgery. And this is called neoadjuvant. Neoadjuvant means we give it before the surgery to try to shrink and control. Uh, with these so-called locally advanced, we don't think that person will ever be able to go to surgery, so um, we treat with systemic therapy. We try to limit the disease from growing in, in the pancreas uh, and maintain quality of life, which is a critical component, especially when patients are having pain or you know, weight loss. The surgery is known as the Whipple, and uh, you can all pronounce that in your head. 
It's the removal of the pancreas head, the duodenum, the common bile duct, and the gallbladder. So it's a big surgery. So again, we want to make sure that our imaging is good, that uh, when we send a patient for the surgery that it's going to be successful. And uh, the surgeon always takes a look before they, before they leap because it's, you know, it's, you don't want to have to do this um, and, and find out the, that uh, it was unwarranted, you know. Um, the critical step for the surgeon is trying to dissect the pancreas off that superior mesenteric artery that I had mentioned earlier. That's a very common involved margin in this disease. So should we remove the blood vessels during the time of surgery? Some, some institutions are doing that. Um, it's becoming a more common practice now to actually resect the vein, the portal vein, or the superior mesenteric vein. Um, and uh, more, more literature is coming in that this is safe, feasible procedure. It's increasing, it's increasing the number of patients who can actually undergo resection. And we hope that's going to lead to increased survival as well. Resecting the artery you know, and, re and, and, and reconstructing it is still considered by most as too morbid, meaning too many side effects. It's a tough surgery, um, and often patients are, are um, <coughs> have a, a lot of post-operative complications. So <clears throat> after you've had the surgery, um, patients will come to the medical oncologist, okay? Again, to get adjuvant or additional uh, treatment, and we call it adjuvant chemotherapy. The idea is to prevent or try to um, uh, limit the uh, disease from coming back again in the future. Um, implying that there was probably some micrometastatic disease that we couldn't see on the imaging, uh, but that over time, uh, given the opportunity, it would grow and form a new lesion on the lung or liver or some other area um, that we, we really don't want to see. And so looking at some of the survivals after surgery alone um, at five years was 10% if you had a lymph node positive and 25% if the lymph node was negative. Um, so one study, uh, fairly recently published in Germany, showed that using that drug gemcitabine, which is one of these drugs that we can't seem to get away from, uh, for about six-month treatment, did double the survival. Um, and so this has become, okay, a standard now after surgery, um, uh, after um, resection at a minimum for a patient to receive six months of gemcitabine. What they also found on this study was that of those who actually recurred uh, after the surgery, about 33% of them occurred at the surgical site, 50% elsewhere. So looking at this 33%, is there any way we can improve the local control to prevent that local relapse? Um, and so radiation uh, has been looked at in a variety of studies. Uh, radiation has been studied, and there's been conflicting results. Uh, in, a, in a United States study, there was a trend towards a better survival. It wasn't what we call statistically significant. Uh, if radiation was used in the head of the pancreas, it seemed to be more effective than not. Uh, but in Europe, another trial showed actually that the survival was worse. Patients had more side effects, and part of that may have been due to the fact that they were getting radiation. There was a delay in actually getting their systemic chemotherapy. So. Uh, in the United States, patients will often be uh, offered radiation uh, as an adjuvant treatment after surgery. Moving forward into the metastatic setting, um, this was mentioned earlier. It's a 1997 study, but often referred to still during many of these talks. Uh, gemcitabine, this is how gemcitabine got on the map, uh, was basically um, a study uh, using this chemotherapy gemcitabine versus 5-fluorouracil in patients with metastatic pancreas cancer. And they saw a slight increase of about a month uh, of overall survival. Uh, there were seeming more patients, if you look at one year or 12 months, patient survival was better than the green, which is the 5-fluorouracil. And they were seeing a little bit of a response. About 5% of the patients would actually have a shrinkage in the tumor. Not until 2011 uh, did we get some new treatment to offer patients um, that showed what we called, again, this survival advantage. Uh, 
So this fulfirinox, I broke it up here because it's actually four drugs, um, although folinic acid, which is leucovorin, is really a, an agent that synergizes with 5 fluorouracil and those are given with arenotecan and oxaliplatinum. So it's, it's a multi-drug regimen that was required to beat gemcitabine alone in a, in, a, uh, in a European study. And we can see that the survival, if you will, the average survival of patients with the metastatic setting went from 6.8 months to 11. And we were seeing responses now, shrinkage in tumor of up to 32% of patients, um, which was just unbelievably exciting to see this kind of number in, in a disease where we were talking about single digits for such a long time. But the benefits of multi-agent chemotherapy, of course, have some costs as well. Um, neutropenia means low white blood count. In the fulfirinox group, it was at least triple low, uh, you know, having a low white count in the gemcitabine group. Neuropathy, that burning, tingling sensation and sometimes pain that people get in their fingers and toes is being seen much more commonly with the fulfirinox group than the gemcitabine group. More fatigue and diarrhea can be seen. So more chemotherapy definitely works better with more side effects. So in 2013, now we're looking at a new combination. Rather than fulfirinox versus gem, we have NAB, placutaxel, or braxane plus gemcitabine. And again, we see a, an improvement in survival, not as robust eight months as the fulfirinox, uh, and not a response rate as high, 23%, as the fulfirinox study. Um, but uh, based on this study, a braxane or nab all the generic name for it, uh, got approval. Um, again, neutropenia, low white count, neuropathy, fatigue were a bit higher, uh, sorry, in this slide, in a braxane gemcitabine uh, than, than with the gemcitabine alone. So obviously, if you add more agents, you're going to have more side effects, but you get a better response rate. So trying to compare <clears throat> the two combination regimens is a common conversation that we might have with patients. Um, the truth is they haven't been compared in a study. So we're trying to compare two different studies. And there's some similarities between the two studies, such as the ages of the patients, the gender, the stage, the uh, percent with liver involvement. But there are many differences. The so-called MPAC study, which is the Abraxane one, allowed for patients with what's called a, a little bit worse performance status. They were more tired and uh, less energy and uh, you know, weight loss and just weren't doing as well at baseline. So a little bit weaker population was, a, was allowed in that study. So um, one might consider that uh, that patient population would do a little worse than the, than the really, really fit patients that weren't feeling many symptoms. Also, the Abraxane study MPAC was done worldwide, whereas the Fulfirinox ProDig study was done primarily in France. It was a very sort of limited scope in patient population. Older age on the IMPAC study and more sites of metastatic disease on the MPAC study. So trying to compare patient populations between the two groups is not terribly feasible. How about comparing the differences in the efficacy? How well does the treatment work? Um, again, we saw that survival advantage of Fulfirinox was 11 months versus the eight months for the combination of gemcitabine and abraxane. But again, we're comparing two different patient populations. And the response rate uh, was actually fairly similar, 29 versus 30%. So how can we compare the data? Again, different patient populations. The impact abraxane study results were more broadly applicable. But really, the only thing we know is that both combinations are more effective than gemcitabine alone. That's the only thing we could actually conclude. However, use, given the sort of less toxic uh, and more broad-based um, capabilities of this combination, it's often being looked at as the backbone for future studies of new agents. It's just easier to combine with fewer side effects. But is chemotherapy the best we can do? And what else can we come up with? This is a classic uh, diagram of so-called the hallmarks of cancer. And these are all the things that Dr. Tuvison thinks about all day long. Uh, <laughs> so he's going to be better at describing a lot of these than, than myself. But 
I have some particular favorites on here. There's many ways in which cancer cells become cancerous. Um, the cells resist dying, uh, the so-called apoptosis. Um, there's, there's mutations that prevent the cells from actually under engaging this process called apoptosis, and, and the cell becomes immortal. Uh, telomerase, and again, sort of another immortality mutation to the cancer cell. Um, glycoly uh, uh, glycolysis. Um, so cells need metabolized sugar, as we talked about earlier, and you know, dysregulating this machinery can, can potentially be a target um, uh, of, of, of cancer uh, treatment. Um, the immune system. Uh, cancer cells, okay, love to avoid the immune system. Otherwise, they wouldn't exist. So they have, uh, potentially, they have uh, proteins on them, and we're going to get to that in a minute, that actually help to evade the immune system, and in, in fact, to actually even shut it down a bit. Uh, inflammation. Uh, there's, there's many, many other t things we can be thinking about um, besides chemotherapy, which is really just sort of a nonspecific chemical agent uh, that's geared to uh, kill dividing cells as they're trying to grow. So many other more targeted and thoughtful approaches. One of the ones that was mentioned earlier was so-called attacking the stroma. Um, there's a, the blue cells are represented in this diagram here as the tumor cells and so-called stromal cells, which are part of the backbone or the matrix of the, of the, of the organ that helps um, also provide uh, support uh, to the uh, normal, uh, to the normal uh, cellular architecture. And the idea here is that there's something called a matrix, extracellular matrix that gets laid down, these little black lines. Um, and in the pancreas cancer situation, there's an excess amount of this matrix, this ECM. And as we see this blood vessel with the drugs trying to come in, the chemotherapy, um, there's a lot of blocking of that chemotherapy getting into the tumor in the first place. And this hyaluronidase, or the drug named PEG-PH20, is a drug to try to minimize or shrink or cleave this ECM to allow more penetration of, of drug okay, into the tumor and more blood flow and to decrease the pressure of the tumor. And so uh, PEG-PH20 is something that I've been using uh, in clinical trials for about three or four or five years, uh, about four years I think we've been using this um, and has shown some exciting um, early clinical evidence of activity. It's been reported at a number of national meetings. Um, and you can give this with chemotherapy to help, okay, improve the delivery of the chemotherapy to the tumor. So this is one novel technique. Targeting an Achilles heel uh, of pancreas cancer, can we find, like in melanoma, for instance, about 40% of melanomas have a mutation in a protein called BRAF. And that mutation, when it occurs, turns on the cell division machinery. Um, and we see these amazing results, long patients living for, for, this is just months, but some of these patients go out for years uh, on these targeted therapies, targeting a specific mutation in the tumor cell. It turns out pancreas cancer has a RAS mutation similar to that of melanoma that's mutated in m most of the cases of pancreas cancer, but we have not yet been able to target this particular protein. But this would be a, uh, a, a, a great uh, breakthrough. Um, there are some drugs in, in trials looking at uh, blocking. This is traditionally be considered unblockable or undruggable target. Um, so this might be a potential future for us as well, so targeted therapy. Immunotherapy, the immune system. So in 2013, cancer immunotherapy was called the breakthrough of the year. Well, I mean, it was voted upon by the editors at Science. Um, actually, in this, in this edition of Science, I, I believe also one of the runners-up was organoids as well, I, I think. So uh, there's, there's, there's many, many things that uh, could be considered breakthroughs. But uh, this cancer immunotherapy, um, is particularly interesting because 
It has the advantages of an application to a diverse range of tumor types. So it's not just one uh, tumor type. It, uh, the, the immunotherapy can be used to treat lung cancer, melanoma, and hopefully pancreas cancer in the future as well. And whereas in, with chemotherapy and with so-called targeted agents, those things develop resistance. They find ways to uh, bypass the blockage that you've, occur that you've induced with your targeted agent. So in the cancer immunotherapy, resistance is not really seen. And the editors that year said, you know, cancer, uh, uh, cancer weapons include surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy, and immunotherapy is to now be considered a fourth weapon against cancer. This is a little bit busy slide here, but the idea here is basically this is your lymphocyte, your activated T cell. This is the cell that's going to go out and do the business. This is the business end of the immune system to attack, okay, the tumor cell. The tumor cell actually has on it a protein called PDL1 that can turn off PD1, which is the receptor on the T cell. And when, it, when it engages that receptor and turns it on, rather, uh, when it engages that receptor, the T cell becomes uh, energic. It stop, stops functioning. New inhibitors against this interaction are now actually FDA approved and showing extremely good outcomes in other diseases like melanoma and lung cancer. CTLA-4, okay, is also involved in this immune uh, synapse over here, the antigen-presenting cell and the, and the T cell again. Uh, interacting. CTLA-4 is basically a, um, a breaking mechanism for the interaction of the T cell and the immune system. And these inhibitors have been likened to the pedals on a car, if you will. CTLA-4 inhibitors take the brakes off the immune system by allowing the T cells to start becoming more active. And the PD-1 inhibitors press in the accelerator to, to prevent them from the T cells from becoming energic and sleepy, but to wake them up to fight the tumor. This is a very nonspecific process um, and has to be uh, honed in very, very more specifically geared towards certain tumor types uh, like pancreas cancer. Uh, some tumors have been extremely um, sensitive to immune therapy, um, again, melanoma being one of them, um, showing these very long uh, prolonged um, what we call survival curves. Uh, patients are, some patients are out now on some of these drugs out seven years with metastatic melanoma, a disease that had a survival of six months uh, up until this point in time. In pancreatic cancer, um, there is a vaccine program currently going on at Hopkins, um, and uh, I borrowed this slide from uh, uh, not Dr. Lee, but uh, Dr. Zhang. Um, this is a vaccine called GVAX. Um, and this is one of the earlier efforts now looking at applying immune treatment to pancreatic cancer. Um, and these are patients, okay, that um, had previously been treated. Uh, the blue, uh, well, all patients got something, but the, the combination arm, the blue, uh, got both the GVAX vaccine, which is a basically sort of an immunization type approach towards pancreas cancer, trying to educate the immune system to search and destroy the tumor cells, um, plus another uh, arm of the vaccine, which is geared towards spe a specific protein in the pancreas cancer cell. But they're starting to see now, you know, longer and longer times of survival with patients receiving these kinds of vaccines, and now. Such studies are including using such vaccines like GVAX. Oop, I'm not done. <laughs> uh, using the GVAX and then also combining it with the aforementioned immune checkpoint inhibitors like CTLA-4 and PD-1. So to really um, in, have the immune system engaged specifically for the pancreas cancer proteins of interest with the goal of effect, uh, creating more effective cancer immunotherapy. So again, this is another uh, really exciting area of potential uh, future work. And um, I look forward to uh, 
um, to hear what David has to say as well. Um, there's just, again, there's many more targets and opportunities uh, going forward, and we really look forward to working with you in the future, Dave. So that was a terrific uh, overview of the clinical reality um, in pancreas cancer, and, and Craig spoke about uh, the multiple modalities which are available for patients today, and he actually touched on a, a good number of the investigational approaches, immunotherapy, new targeted agents, et cetera. Um, there's going to be a little bit of overlap between our talks, but not much, uh, fortunately. Uh, and so this is a picture of how it looks right now out there. And um, again, being in a place like this, uh, you can concentrate. You're, you can work on awful diseases like uh, pancreatic cancer and you know, appreciate what you're doing um, at, the same, at the same time. The, uh, and I want to thank uh, Mike Fagan and Danny Engel for providing some slides, uh, or at least inspiration, for some of the uh, things I'm going to say. So I'm going to take about five slides and talk about cancer just as a generic problem and then get into pancreas cancer. And so cancer is, when you, when you poll the public, cancer is the one thing that they're afraid of, more than earthquakes, hurricanes, taxes, Red Sox, whatever. Um, and uh, you know, it's, that's how it's been. Uh, and so the, uh, the young fellow who wrote that book um, from Columbia, you know, touches on that, but I don't think really recognize that as the fundamental reason why people were uh, so interested in reading about this disease. Um, and from way back until now, we have actually accomplished a lot in, in fighting this disease, particularly in childhood cancers, Hodgkin's disease, germ cell tumors, et cetera. Um, and what did we learn in those cancers where things are better? Um, well, we learned how to enroll patients on trials. And so th in the pediatric space, we actually enroll most kids on trials when they don't have a disease for which there's curative therapy. We're not very good at that in the adult uh, stage. We're terrible. We enroll 5% of patients on trials, even though the outcome of the disease is terrible. And that's a societal mistake. That's a health system problem. That's, that's something that's not acceptable. Um, and it turns out in pediatric cancers, not all, but certain, particularly blood cancers, that children have, um, the cells are very responsive to chemotherapies, the classic cytotoxic drugs, which were developed not to fight cancer, but to fight people um, initially. They were used in warfare. Um, and versions of them uh, are used to uh, fight cancer, as you know. So what is the problem that we have, uh, being in this audience mostly adults? Uh, the disease cancer is mostly, not completely, but mostly incurable. Um, we don't enroll patients on trials, and so we don't learn while we're moving uh, along. And the cancer cells are more different than the pediatric cancer cells are. They have lots of mutations. Um, and because they have lots of mutations, they have lots of alternative paths they, they can take. They can adopt different fates um, very easily. They can spread through the body. They can act like a different organism. Um, and so what do we need to do? Well, you know, you, you've heard the themes from, um, from Dr. DeVoe, but, you know, we need to do better. You know, we need to uh, see the cancer early. We need to extinguish it when it's there. Um, and we need uh, therapies that we can take every day. Um, and to do that, we have to enroll patients on trials. And the bit on the end, on the bottom of the slide is entirely true. Um, so how are we going to do this? So Craig actually showed a more scientific slide, which is called the Hallmarks of Cancer, uh, which is uh, compulsory reading for anybody who um, wishes to take a scientific uh, approach to the, the disease. Um, he used the term Achilles heel, which is uh, something that we adopted from uh, the, uh, the, the great uh, German uh, chemist who <coughs> coined the term uh, chemotherapy. Um, Paul, uh, Paul Ehrlich, and uh, he was trying to develop drugs not to kill cancer cells, but to kill microbes, uh, because infection actually was the major cause of death uh, prior to uh, us becoming more aware of cancer. I have a simple way I think of it, and what we re really need to do in cancer is to find what I call the black heart of the disease. 
and the black heart of cancer is something that um, is something that the cancer cell needs, but the normal cell does not need. And it can be anything. Um, and it could be something on that wheel that Dr. DeVoe showed of the hallmarks of cancer, or maybe something else. Um, that's something we have to identify, and we, do we try to do that in the laboratory. I talked about adult cancer being worse than pediatric. It is. It is much worse. Um, and as I said, the, the cells are very flexible. They can kind of move around physically, and they can change what their decisions are going to be day to day. And I have this uh, phrase here, all cancer cells can become stem cells. You're going to hear about the organoid system. The organoid is essentially a version of stem cells. Um, you all started off as one cell that became two, four, eight, etc. cetera. Uh, cancer is kind of like that. It recapitulates ontogeny. It recapitulates development. And cancer is going backwards in time a lot of times. And so cancer cells have that plastic ability to uh, change themselves, like the Star Trek when there was the, the bad guys that could, um, uh, I forget what their name was, the Klingons or something. And um, they could vanish and appear and be invisible or change shape and all the rest. Cancer cells are like that. Craig talked about the ecosystem of tumors. This is something that we think about. It's something that. Uh, uh, Doug Fearon's lab is focused on 100%. It's very important in cancer, maybe more important in pancreas than other types of cancer. And this is the support network, the, uh, the, the group therapy of cancer. Um, and it's made of all types of cells. And you saw a picture from uh, Craig's slide. And we, we think cancer is a lichen. You know what lichens are, those green things that stuck on logs and rocks in the woods, two organisms that need each other. Cancer is like that. You have the cancer cell, the neoplastic cell, and then the supporting cells. They feed each other. They keep each other company. That's how all cancers are, particularly pancreas. And again, you can think of that ecosystem as something where you may find a black heart that you can target. Uh, and this is, again, where the immune system may be involved. So the last general slide, um, there was a really bright um, scientist uh, in the 1800s, um, Robert Koch, who uh, developed a very rigorous way of analyzing whether you can determine the cause of infectious disease, and it's called Koch's uh, postulates, and he used this to actually identify the causative organisms of some awful um, infections like anthrax um, and others, and you can apply his logic to cancer uh, to identify the so-called black hearts of cancer, and that's what we do in the laboratory. And so we use all forms of scientific methods available to us to do such work. So we use genetics, chemistry, all, all, all types of things. And so we're doing this to find those black hearts of cancer, and I'm going to show you one of them here. And we try to trap the flexibility of cancer. I said cancer can go from here to there and become a Klingon or whatever and move around. Um, you can use that also as a way to strategically go after and and uh, suffocate the disease. Um, and, and then finally, this ecosystem I talked about. We can study that now because of the new uh, systems that we have available, the organoids, et cetera. OK, so you, um, you heard some things from Dr. DeVoe about pancreas cancer. The one that sort of take home slide is here. Um, pancreas cancer is bad today. It could be worse tomorrow. And we don't exactly know why. Uh, this is a prediction. Uh, but the purple line, which is the pancreas color, is going up in numbers of people that are getting the disease and projected to uh, lose the battle to the disease, um, whereas the lines for colon and breast and prostate are going down. And we don't know why that is. Uh, we don't think there's a, you know, some new event that's occurred. We don't think it's because we're smarter now and so we see pancreas cancer. Um, but we are thinking about why that may be. Um, we know we have to do better. We have to get in better therapies and better diagnostics. But it, it's raised, I think, the attention of people who don't study pancreatic cancer to uh, come and talk with us. You heard of this from Craig already. People are diagnosed either with early cancer or up here or advanced cancer shown below. Um, and it's a pretty bad disease no matter what. Um, you heard from uh, Craig that the disease makes people sick uh, so they don't feel well, can't eat much, lose weight, you know, et cetera. We would love to find patients early, and you'll hear one of our discoveries about how we think we're going to make that happen. 
Um, and the cancer cells are tough. So they're tougher than a lung cancer cell, prostate cancer cell, breast cancer cell. And we, we have some understanding of why that is. And, um, and we're trying to apply that in the lab. I have one slide on why do we get pancreas cancer, because I, this is a question we all get, my postdocs get, um, and I'll give you our best answer that we have so far. We get cancer in general because there's mutations. If there's no mutations, there's not really any cancer. Um, and again, mutations are changes in the DNA structure that Jim Watson helped solve with Francis Crick and many others in England uh, 60 years ago. And there are particular mutations that matter. And uh, Craig talked about KRAS. KRAS is, is like the, the bad guy. It's the Darth Vader of pancreas cancer. Um, we don't have a treatment for KRAS, and that's a problem. We have clever ways around it, that sort of thing, and you'll hear about that today. Um, but I just came back from a meeting in, in Boston where I, I, I gave lecture in a seminar with four other people, and two of them actually have invented new chemicals that can bind to KRAS in efforts to kill it. Now, you, everyone in this audience has taken a drug for some reason, for headache, for infection, for um, a variety of things, blood pressure, whatnot. Drugs do one thing, which is they bind to an area on a protein and take up space so that the thing it binds to doesn't work as well. That's what a drug is. A drug is a piece of tape. And um, that's how we've been forever. Uh, that works when the thing the drug's binding to is moving too fast or too, moving too, uh, is doing things out of sync that you're trying to slow down. Drugs are not good to take a protein and cause it to move faster or cause it to move differently. We don't have drugs that can do that. And the KRAS protein that is really the initiation of pancreas cancer and really the cause of it. It's a, it's a mutation that instead of the protein moving fast, it starts moving slow. And by moving slow, it essentially recruits other molecules to it and initiates the cancer cascade. And we don't have a drug that makes a slow moving thing move fast. And so these two drugs I heard about yesterday in Boston are drugs that bind to KRAS and disable it and remove it. So you bind to Darth Vader and take them out. So it's pretty exciting. My talk was on something else about how you can kill a KRAS mutant pancreas cancer cell, and you'll hear a little snapshot of that. But this is the huge thing. So the KRAS gene is mutated, and we, that's really the main problem in pancreas cancer. There are other mutations in relevant genes, such as the ones that um, Craig talked about, that you can inherit even, but that's less common. Usually they're just mutations that occur. Inflammation promotes pancreas cancer. Inflammation is caused by all kinds of things. You think of inflammation as, you know, you have a rash or something like that, or you, you have a swollen ankle or whatever, and, and same concept, but it's just in the pancreas. And um, that can be caused by a lot of things. So inflammation of the pancreas is called pancreatitis, caused by gallstones, drinking too much, bad luck. Um, this is a promoter of pancreas cancer. As Craig said, tobacco ingestion is also a promoter, maybe because of mutations, but also because of inflammation. Finally, obesity definitely changes your immune milieu and actually does promote inflammation in many tissues. Can we prevent that stuff? Can we prevent mutations or inflammation? Well, yeah, as Craig said, you can not be obese, you can avoid tobacco, limit your alcohol intake, but most mutations you can't prevent. Most mutations are because they're caused by oxygen, and you need oxygen to live. Um, oxygen, when we burn it, when we use it in our mitochondria to make energy, about two-thirds of the time there's a mistake. And you make instead a reactive oxygen species which runs around the cell, and it's just like bleach that you buy to keep your clothes white. It just bleaches the inside of your cell. And when it bleaches your DNA, it actually oxidizes the guanine residue, and so you spend a lot of your energy correcting the oxidative damage on your DNA. There's nothing you can do to change that. This is, the, this is where we live. This is like the reef that we were evolved on. Um, and so I just think most mutations you get are bad luck, not worth talking about or worrying about. Um, how are we gonna defeat pancreas cancer? We have to identify it early, and um, when we don't, we have to have better medicines for it. And so those are the two main themes that we have in the laboratory, and you'll hear blurbs about both of them. While we do that, we find novel targets. And we have these model systems, which are 
interesting. And so this is a picture of the, the models, um, uh, somewhat. Um, we have cells in a dish. We have our, our patients that we care a lot about, and we have um, animal models. And um, uh, when I started working in this field, we made an animal model of pancreas cancer. And by doing so, you can make an early cancer in the pancreas, and the cancer can become an advanced cancer. So you can use these to look for medicines to treat the disease, look for ways to detect the disease early. Um, we also were able to take the animal and test therapies, a thing that uh, Dr. Vo talked a lot about. And this is how you do it. There's a fancy way to find the first tumor with your finger and your thumb. You can actually feel a small tumor in the belly of, a, of an animal. Um, and if you think you see one, you can uh, perform an ultrasound, just like uh, you, you know, one could get in the doctor's office. And you can measure the tumor volume, and then you can treat that mouse with medicines to see does the tumor get smaller or not. And that's, that led to lots of observations, such as this one, um, which Dr. DeVoe mentioned. Uh, this is normal pancreas. This is the cancer um, uh, stained with dyes. Below, you're looking at the blood vessels stained in uh, brown color. And the pancreas cancer is a big white scar. It's a big white scar. And there's not very many blood vessels in it. And so the concept that you couldn't get drugs into the tumor came from this early work from Ken Olive in the laboratory. It also uh, suggested to us that there was less delivery of nutrients, including oxygen, um, and potentially that would change the biology of the tissue. This would also impact the microenvironment. So this is the microenvironment. Here's the cancer cells. This is the microenvironment. So the immune cells, the fibroblasts, everything that's in there are influenced by the, the food stores which exist um, available to them. And this led to models of how we thought of the disease, that there was a problem getting drugs in, a biophysical barrier, a sheath. There were issues about the, the, the microenvironment feeding the cancer cells. And then the work of, of, of my colleague and, and a close friend, Doug Firon, showing that this microenvironment can impact the immune system from getting in, prevent it from getting in, being a, a, a immunorepellent shield. Um, so that was the early work we did in this disease. And as uh, Carrie Kaplan said, when I came here, I was um, uh, impatient that we needed to move faster because I wasn't getting younger and, and you know, these curves were going up and, and all of the rest. And so we decided we were going to take a, a risk and learn about a new system. And my lab was pretty small um, at the time. And uh, we uh, eventually were persuaded to essentially stop everything else and work on developing a new model system. And it looks like this. So it doesn't have a tail or eyes. It um, doesn't talk back. Um, but it does require its diapers changed all the time. And that's said as partially as a joke, but it's just like raising an infant. You have to feed it. You have to split it. You have to do all this stuff. You have to spend your day taking care of these things. And you may say, big deal. But it also, that actually means that the way your workplace is designed has to change. And uh, when I started at the lab, we had a very beautiful lab, and we had this tissue culture room, which is where you grow these things, um, downstairs, and had all kinds of hoods. And I said, this will never be a problem. But it turned out that we had so many people working on these in the laboratory that when I would go into the lab, it would be empty. They, everyone would be downstairs splitting their organoids. Um, and then the other lab PIs would complain to me because their people couldn't use the hoods. Um, and, and this became a good problem, obviously. But, um, it is an amazing system, uh, but it came with different considerations. And so it's colored in two colors because Danny Engel and Hervé Tyriac had the clever idea to make uh, chimeric, meaning a fusion of two different parts of normal cells and malignant cells together in the same organoid. So it's actually a sphere. And by having a, a normal cell next to a malignant cell, you could test a drug such that you were looking for the normal cells to stay there, but the malignant cells to go away then you would have a therapeutic index. The problem with our therapies in cancer patients is we can't give the therapy every day. There are too many side effects. And so we need therapies we can give every day like you could an antibiotic. Um, and so Danny and Hervé set up the system to test therapies, for example, but it's been useful for a variety of things, as, I, as I'll show you. And um, the organoids have been great because it's allowed us to culture the normal as well as the malignant stage of the cancer and the parts in between. And when you grow it, it looks like this under the microscope. Um, it's very pleasing to people. 
Um, and you can grow up from a normal pancreas, one that, with a, that has a tumor that a surgeon can take out, or one that has a, a tumor that instead of taking it out in the operating theater, a, a small needle is taken to um, assess it, to biopsy it. And Hervé and Vincenzo um, and Danny and many others have worked out conditions to grow this uh, rapidly, all in collaboration with a, a laboratory in Utrecht, Holland, run by Hans Klevers, um, who's a, a world-class scientist. When uh, Chang'e Wang, um, our uh, veterinary scientist uh, graduate, um, who's a postdoc in the lab, transplanted these into the mouse pancreas, they grew as a normal, as an early human cancer over the first month, and over the next month, over a, as a high-grade early cancer, and then by the couple months later, they were invasive cancer, suggesting that we've reprogrammed or allowed plasticity to occur such that the cells can start off as an early cancer and become a late cancer. The relevance of that is it's hard to find humans that have this problem. And if we can find humans with this problem, we could use that to define new biomarkers, early detection methods for pancreas cancer, or drugs that would be useful to make the early disease go away. And so this is a, this amazing uh, new system. And so I'm going to give you two examples now. So this is Christine Shu. She's a... Um, uh, a great uh, postdoc in the lab who took this, these um, organoids and asked, is there some pathway which maybe is a black heart of pancreas cancer? And she found one. And the one that she found has a um, name that uh, doesn't work in cocktail parties, but it's called NRF2. And it's a black heart of pancreas cancer because when you get rid of it in human pancreas organoids, over half of them just give up. And they give up, they die. And um, you can do this using genetic methods. Um, and, and when they give up and die, and the ones that don't die, actually the red peak becomes the blue peak. They become full of reactive oxygen. I told you about reactive oxygen, the bleach of cells, which causes all kinds of problems. Cancer cells are nervous about bleach. Um, you know, maybe I've convinced you that cancer cells are tough and smart and no, no, no. Cancer cells are dumb and weak. And you know they are slow, and um, they carry around a lot of toxic assets, like unfolded proteins, and uh, lots of things they didn't finish. They have you know all these projects in them inside of them that are unfinished business, and reactive oxygen is very toxic to cancer cells. Um, and so when she gets rid of nerve two, when Christine gets rid of nerve two, the cancer cells are loaded with reactive oxygen. Half of them can't make it, but the ones that do, she can study. And so she studied with uh, Daryl Pappen, who's a uh, world-leading um, proteomics expert here at Cold Spring Harbor, what was happening. She tried to figure out what was wrong. And they have this uh, diagram here of where they took a chemical and asked what were the proteins which were now oxidized in the cell when Nrf2 was missing. And so they, they followed all these steps, and what they found was that the ability of the cell to make new proteins was decreased. And so a cell does many things. It, you know, it makes energy. It makes more of itself. How to make more of itself is you have to double the number of things you have in it before you divide. So you're constantly making new protein, for example. And what Christine and Daryl found was that the translational apparatus of the cell didn't work when you got rid of the her protein. And she could see that on the right because the, the curve in red turned into the curve in blue. Um, by working with a, a, a terrific scientist in McGill University, Nahum Sonnenberg. And this is actually, this may look subtle to you, but this is like, you know, this is Sunday. This is like touchdown, two-point conversion. This is like the signal you look for. Um, the red one's going down, going down to blue here and coming up here. It looks very subtle, but it's, it's actually, this is a signal in science. It may seem, again, you know, very subtle, but, you know, it, it's... Uh, this is, a, is an incredible signal, and she was able to take this information and find drugs that could do the same as getting rid of the gene, and the drugs that she's come, in, come up with actually caused the pancreas tumors in these mouse models to stop growing. So they're just flatlined. And now she's trying to treat these animals for as long as, as we can and, uh, and try to get you know, great survival curves with them. And so it's a, it's a new therapy. Um, new therapeutic approach. And so I presented this data next to these people that have like chem uh, new chemical companies and stuff like that to find the new RAS inhibitors. And um, all I can say is more journal editors talk to me about her paper than they talk to them. Um, but more stock investors talk to them, um, which is actually all true. Um, 
And so this is an exemplar. But we have this new animal facility that was built um, as part of the, um, what we wanted uh, to come back uh, here uh, to Cold Spring Harbor to set up everything. And the new animal facility um, has a preclinical experimental therapeutics um, uh, opportunity that I think is unparalleled uh, anywhere around here. And our first project is called uh, Project Lazarus, which is going to sound maybe a bit unusual, but it's meant to, it, it, it means that. It's, we, are, we have animal models of, of metastatic pancreas, lung, and prostate cancer, and we are going to learn how to, how to rescue those animals. And um, we, recruited, we were able to recruit a really terrific imaging expert, Scott Lyons, from Cambridge, England, uh, to head up the imaging, and a terrific uh, scientist for, who was in my laboratory for a while, uh, Young Park, who's going to run the um, therapeutics side of things. And the way this works is that um, we have animals that have a tumor that glows, but when we take away the KRAS gene, for, for example, the tumor stops growing. And we see what happens when you have a really good therapy. You watch the whole process of regression, et cetera. You see exactly what happens. And by doing so, you develop biomarkers, ways to measure that things are going well. And the ones that we have that Craig uses every day, that I, I've used um, when I, I do clinical work are, are x-rays, CAT scans, MRIs, things like that. And that's OK, but that's slow, and, and you really can't tell day to day what's going on. Um, we need much better, finer methods. And this, this Project Lazarus will find that for us. Um, because um, unfortunately, even in the BRAF inhibitors and melanoma, the tumors almost you know, uniformly do come back. And the biomarkers of tumor shrinkage uh, flipped on its head is going to be the biomarker of the tumor coming back. Um, and so this is a project that we have, and Scott and Young are, are leading that up. And then the last exemplar I'll show you is the biomarker one. Um, these are fish that were caught last year when the, when the um, bunker were schooling better than they are this year. Um, and this is Mariano, who has gone back to um, Pamplona, uh, Spain. Uh, and this is Danny, who's the uh, queen of biomarkers. Um, and uh, this is the bluefish, and don't wear sandals when you fish for them. Um, the, um, the, the point about uh, the early detection of, of pancreas cancer was made by a paper from Bert Vogelstein, who was mentioned by Carrie, and Christina Cabozio Donahue when they were both at Hopkins. Um, and that was done by studying deeply the, the disease um, in, 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 in patients who had succumbed from uh, pancreas cancer. And they predicted by using molecular archaeology that the disease took 15 to 20 years to occur from early to late. And so this paper provided hope that if we were smarter, we could find that disease at an early stage when it's maybe even smaller than an MRI would show it so that we would look for it and take it out. So um, how you find the disease in patients today is haphazard. There's, no, there's not really a way to do so. But there is a blood biomarker we do um, follow in patients called CA199. Um, and we thought, uh, after discussing with uh, a scientist in uh, Nebraska, Tony Hollingsworth, that CA199 would be a good biomarker to work on in our mouse models. The problem was is that mice don't make this biomarker. And so what Danny did was she made a mouse that made the human, pro the human glycosylation change. So she, she humanized the mouse glycome. So glycome means glycosylation. Proteome is proteins. And um, about half your proteins that are outside the cell, meaning on the cell membrane or in the blood, have glycosylation on it. It's like the icing on a cake. And, and like you know, every cupcake can look different. Every protein can look different. And um, again, there's a type of icing that we make that mice don't. But Danny put the human icing into the mouse. And when she did that, these are gels you would see on TV, possibly, where you get these a lot of bands here and very few bands here, for example. And so she can see in the blood of mice <clears throat> that there's all these CA199 positive proteins because the, the antibody binds CA199, but these bands are all proteins, which are now present in mice that would never be present otherwise. And she's used this type of strategy to actually identify in mice early biomarkers of pancreas cancer. And um, so there's all this stuff in here, all these colored spots. These are potentially early biomarkers in, in mice. And we're excited because when she does the next test and look in human blood, she's found, using this strategy here, some of them in the blood of humans. 
and nobody's ever thought about these markers. And so it's early days, it's not proof, but it's exciting, and we think this is gonna be a new way to uh, go about it. And this, again, is a mass spec approach that uh, Daryl Pappen is helping us with. So we use genetics, we use chemistry, we use biochemistry in efforts to find new therapies, in efforts to find new ways to detect and, and follow the, the tumor. So um, last week, uh, we had our picture taken on Friday. Um, uh, this is uh, November. Some of you know this is the Pancreas Cancer Awareness Month. I have my second uh, purple tie on today. Um, but uh, this was the team of, of all the people who um, were present for the photo. Many of my lab members, um, I have a, you know, I'm blessed with a terrific lab. I have uh, nine postdocs, five students, um, four staff scientists, <clears throat> and, uh, and one Sandra. That's my Sandra. Um, and uh, who's my... Um, uh, who's my, you know, sort of master of, uh, master of the office and uh, keeps everything running properly. Um, they all came together for, <clears throat> for this photo, and this is a little, uh, 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 you know, flag that we, did, that we got together for the Jones Beach watch, Walk, and uh, they're all carrying, you know, some type of sign here about, you know, fighting pancreas cancer, et cetera. And, you know, the, you know many of my lab are here. There are members of Doug Furon's lab. There's Mike, um, who's a who's been a joint member uh, with my lab, and they're a member of the Mikola's lab, and they're members of other labs, I'm not even sure what labs, um, who are all excited to, uh, to fight pancreas cancer. So there must be 30 people on that slide. Everyone's smiling except me. Um, <laughs> I noticed that after they sent me the picture, but um, I'm not supposed to be satisfied, so, and I'm not. Um, so, uh, and that happened last week, and, and, and after this talk, which is gonna be over in 60 seconds, some of my people are here, and you should talk to them. They have purple on, possibly. And so how are we going to take this kind of science and do something productive with it? Um, well, when we do our science, it's productive because other people learn about it and they do clinical trials. But you know, we're actually pretty capable of doing that ourselves, and, um, and we would like to uh, be involved in that as much as we can. Um, I talked about the Lazarus Project, which is something we have going we, with Christine's observation. We're now going to push hard on reactive oxygen therapies, there's a variety of ways to do that. Um, but how are we gonna do that exactly? And so uh, some of you are aware that um, the health system at uh, North Shore LIJ has signed a, a, an agreement with Culture Harbor to help um, translate some of the basic science discoveries into the clinic by helping to construct a, an experimental therapeutic unit and uh, where the physicians um, who will be working in, in this space will be um, very versed, uh, uh, versed with the science that we were talking about and work with us to develop clinical trials, et cetera. And that's something uh, which is in, you know, occurring you know, right now. Um, we also have this uh, PEDEX facility that I talked about that Scott and Young are running um, with Stephanie, our, uh, our terrific uh, vet. Um, and we are training this next generation of uh, cancer scientists to be thinking about basic science in this translational space. Um, in the beginning of my talk, I said the problem is we're not learning enough because not enough patients are going on trials. I fully believe that. And I think that it should be mandatory for cancer patients to be offered the chance to be on a trial. It's up to the patient to decide if they want to enroll. But it should be mandatory for doctors and health plans and insurance companies and hospitals to offer it to all patients. Um, and we hope that that will occur so that more can be learned from each patient and they can, be, they can feel like they're participating more in the process of improving things because almost all patients want to do that. Um, so how will we do that? We have to change the way we do clinical trials. We can't do the, you know, the way we are now. We, ha we have to modify what we've done in the past. And these are things that I would like to test in this new clinical trial uh, apparatus, microdosing. You give small doses and you look for big effects. Um, and you know, delivery devices to multiplex therapies where you can test several things at once, maybe in the same tumor. And there are some recent discoveries uh, talking about this. We would like to enroll patients on trials if their organite tells us that th that's the right trial. This is a, a question that we have right now. I didn't present that type of work that Hervé is leading up, but we are, you know, I, I think, um, w we think that this is gonna be the approach. Um, and uh, we think that a lot of these things will be driven by this uh, inv investigational uh, phase one unit. 
So I have a lot of people to thank, and I have two thank you slides. This is again the, this was last year, um, the picture. Um, but I have to thank uh, the chairman of our board, who has been very supportive, uh, Jamie uh, Biondi, uh, Bruce Stillman, who's the um, president of Cold Spring Harbor, who. <laughs> who, at, when I was talking to him four years ago, he said, we'll just try to start a clinic. And I said, no, 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 we don't need to do that because um, you will lose the identity of this place and it will just be, it won't work. Um, but he figured out another way to do it. Jim Watson, who many of you know, is very impatient um, and he's you know, brilliant. Uh, and so when I, he came to see me in my first year, he wanted to know when I was gonna be done. And I said, what do you mean, when am I gonna be done? <laughs> and. Um, Anyway, I had to sign this piece of paper, and I still have it on my, on my office wall. It says, we we're going to finish in five. We both signed it. That means I have three years left, I think. Um, Bob Vizza, who couldn't make it, unfortunately, tonight because he uh, has a, a cold, but um, he has a lot of uh, wise quotes, and this is one of them, make what you can sell the cure. And so he says, don't, make what, don't sell what you can make, make what you can sell, which, you know, as a scientist, it's harder to think like that. Um, but you know there are some issues that he, I think he does bring something I call discovery management um, uh, to me, and I've learned a lot from him. Alan and Edith Seligson, um, who are supporters, but you know always uh, sort of pushing me, just like my folks would if they were here. Um, my wife, who says stay later to finish the work. Uh, today um, I got to uh, tell her she could stay later to finish her work because she has an assignment due at five o'clock actually. Um, uh, Craig, um, this is a new chapter, um, and I'm looking forward to uh, some really great uh, collaborations. And of course, you know, I mean, the reason I went into this a long time ago is my patients never got better. And, um, you know, sadly, I, I still have a problem. And um, that's not, you know, good enough. But, and the people who join are, you know, the apostles, and they're amazing. And uh, you for listening. And so then, this is sort of the scientific thank you slide. I showed Christine and Danny's unpublished unsubmitted data, and the people in orange were uh, from Holland who enabled our organized work. Daryl, I mentioned many times. Um, the funding, really, we wouldn't be doing this work if it weren't for the Les Garden Foundation uh, recruiting me here and setting up the designated uh, laboratory. Um, it, this, it, you know, this is really uh, an amazing outcome. Uh, but we work uh, very well with Memorial, where um, I have a, a, an appointment um, in the GI uh, program with Hopkins, where I um, have had for you know over 25 years now strong liaisons uh, was where I met Doug actually um, I sat for a PhD with Doug many years ago um, and, uh, and and that's where I went to medical school um, and this is the Utrecht symbol and this is the this is our former symbol so uh, again you know thanks for your patience I know usually this only goes on for one hour not for one hour and 35 minutes. Um, but uh, we are here for questions at the podium or questions in person. Um, I'm glad that you all think that uh, this is a disease worth uh, working on in a place like this. And thanks again.